Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to my session um, talking about high performance Drupal on your local box to make you a productive Drupal developer. Uh, my name is Christoph. I work at Sage Free Solutions down in San Diego. Um, in a previous career, I worked in high performance computing, looked after hundreds of servers and uh, kept them humming along. So that's where my high performance interest comes from and some of my background. Um, let's talk first about distraction intervals. This is sort of the backbone to my theory why it matters that you have good performance both on your local box and on your production servers. Um, up to about half a second is a interval that you are hardwired to not really notice much. Um, it's basically the blink of an eye, right? Back when we uh, lived in caves and we're out in the savannah hunting, if you stared a saber-toothed tiger in the eye, you could blink and get away with it and survive. That's biologically, that's what we're really uh, good at. Um, incidentally, also, a website that gives you a page refresh in half a second is considered a fast site, right? That, that sort of goes hand in hand. So this is completely effortless. You're hardwired to not lose focus at all. Um, then may, another key interval is up to about two seconds where you can train yourself, and most of us have trained ourselves, you can stay focused, you can wait those two seconds and just stay on task. Um, but it does cost you energy because you're not hardwired. So you actually have to spend mental energy to stay in there. Um, also, incidentally, two seconds is considered uh, you know, a, a decent page load time on your web server. Uh, you really don't want to go above that. There are various studies out there that talk about this, and it's sort of a nonlinear relationship, but you do want to stay below that to make your site you know, uh, nice for your customers, and if it takes longer, they will just say, you know what, I'm out of here. Then sort of another key interval is around the five-second mark. That's when you have to wait this long for things to happen, your mind starts to wander. This is pretty automatic. You can't help yourself. You have to really try hard not to. Um, it gets worse in this day and age where things always happen in parallel and we're trying to multitask, which is a bad habit, by the way. Um, but staying focused for five seconds at a time costs you a lot of energy. Um, and if you really don't want to let your mind wander. And anything that's longer than that is basically impossible to rein your, uh, retain your focus for in a sustained manner. You are going to do something else during those longer intervals. It's a guarantee. Um, so the upshot of this is if we're talking about productivity of getting things done, um, your, the response time when you do things matters for your productivity. You're going to spend extra energy if you have to wait. And this is why you want to make your tools responsive. And that's why your local box and its speed matters to you. It's not just that this thing is crazy fast and it makes you happy as an engineer and uh, you, know, you get bragging rights and all that stuff. It's about you not having to spend mental energy on things that you don't care about so that you can spend your mental energy on building your site correctly, on coding your PHP correct, and all that fun stuff. That's what you're in, after all. And not getting distracted because you're waiting and things happen, you know, all that fun stuff. So, if we're talking Drupal, here's a heat map of the attention that within the Drupal community the various pieces in our stack get, right? Drupal itself, when you look at performance, there are lots of posts out there, lots of people talk about, there's a, I think about three or four sessions here in this camp about your Drupal performance. Um, then if we look at the LAMP stack, you sort of get a lot of attention on PHP and MySQL speed, some on Apache, then it's a bit less on Linux because that's considered almost outside of our realm. And then basically nobody talks about hardware, right? Um, now because I come from the hardware side of things, uh, I'm going to focus on this. Um, and sort of invert that heat map today. You can get plenty of other stuff. So here's a recent post by a friend of mine, Sean Smiley for the Chief Internet, uh, where he talks about what you can do at the LAMP stack and Drupal level to make your site fast and also your local environment fast. So you can get plenty of this information, including this one, so I won't focus on this at all today. So here's an interesting quote. 
from um, Catherine Lawrence of, of Peng V, um, that really what has for the longest time held us back and is still holding us back is actually the actual hardware, the servers. Um, and it can be traced back to a large extent to uh, rotating uh, platters and disk drives. Um, and basically the upshot is manipulating data is the rate limiting step. And that's where the speed of your local environment will come from if, if you make changes there. And that's some of the stuff we're talking about. So let's focus first on the CPU. Uh, a little picture of a, a server chip, but the, our, you know, the laptop chips look a lot like this. Uh, a few years ago, Intel made a major change um, on the server side that the Xeon 5500 was the major transition. On the desktop, it was the core i5 and i7 series, and to a lesser extent, the i3s, although if you're a series developer, you probably don't want to live on a box with, with an i3 inside. Um, what they really introduced there was the quick path interconnect, which basically put the controller for your PCI bus in, in your computer straight on the chip itself as opposed to an external chip. And they also introduced an integrated memory controller right onto the chip itself on the, on the CPU. So another external piece of silicon that was in, uh, eliminated. What that means is that the latency with which these two parts are accessed is um, significantly lower and the upshot is that clock for clock, these chips for just the things that we care about, file serving, web serving, are about twice as fast. So, you know, you, if you still have an old laptop um, with, uh, say, a Core 2 Duo inside or something, uh, you really want to upgrade to the latest. That's going to be, make a major difference for you. And, um, you know, this, the 2x performance is not just what I've been reading. I've been seeing it when we looked at comparable boxes, both at the, at the laptop and desktop level, but also at the server level. It's, it's really quite amazing what they did. And you get it for free in an upgrade. Okay, so that's the CPU. Short story, just stay current. It'll pay back in, in spades. Now, um, storage. The big problem is latency. And we'll, we'll get back to throughput and stuff later on, and I'll tell you why throughput is really not all that big of a deal. So here's the big picture. Um, notice that the scale on this graph is logarithmic, right? It's, we go from nanoseconds to microseconds to milliseconds. So that's uh, you know, steps of 1,000 fold each one. So on the left, you have CPU and RAM, which are in the nanosecond range in terms of how quickly you can talk to them from your software. And then on the right, we have the hard drive, which is in the multiple milliseconds range for how long it takes until you get a response from the hard drive. And then there's this big gap in the middle. So our database is going to live on the hard drive. And on the CPU and the RAM, you're going to have the various caching layers, memcached, um, uh, other things. And the trick is that when you need persistent storage, it needs to be on your disk drives. And all of your caching is not going to be persistent. That's what's going to bite you in terms of throughput uh, later on. But we've got this thing. Now, let's take a sort of a travel through history. Um, 1983, the birth of the PC, this is where we were at. Um, access to CPU and RAM was in the millisecond range. Disks were in the dozens of milliseconds. And then this happened. CPUs went a thousand fold faster. RAM almost, there's a little gap in between. And um, if you've been paying attention to some of the hardware, you may know that this increasing gap between CPU and RAM has been a major headache for people. People have worked really, really hard uh, because they could. And we have now caching layers. You know, your CPU has a level one, a level two, a level three cache in some cases and all sorts of crazy things just to deal with that tiny gap there in between. But, you know, over, over on the right is the hard drives. And notice what happens to those over the almost 20 years, near nothing. And we've got a huge gulf. And people just don't talk about it because they can't have any good answers to that except help with caching at the RAM level and all that. 
So what can we do? Now lately we've had a bunch of things that happened, uh, namely solid state drives, both SATA based, you know, the, that you can plug into your, into your disk interface and PCI based cards that you can plug into a server or a desktop uh, machine and those fall not smack in the middle but much more in the middle and get your storage, your persistent storage closer to where the CPU and the RAM are. So, and all of these are going to be persistent. That's going to give us a major speed boost, and we'll talk in more detail about this. And then the thing comes up, but I heard flash wears out. These things will die on you. Does it really? So, um, a couple of years ago, I bought this drive, uh, 50 gigabyte, which was comparatively cheap at the time, $210, with the intent to kill it by writing to it until it died. So this is what we did. It's rated at 5,000 cycles of programming and erasing data. So we kept this going for 21 days on our, on our test server. Uh, we wrote 350 terabytes total to this little drive. That was 16 and a half terabytes per day. Um, you first have to work really hard to actually get to that level of being able to write to a thing. It's, it doesn't come for free. Um, we're talking 7,500 program erase cycles, and at that point, we got tired of the experiment. We were 50% over the rated cycles, and the drive was still going strong. So we stopped this. Today, this drive lives in a central server at my former employer and is still going strong. So as far as I'm concerned, on the busiest server that I had in my previous job, we were looking at about 20 gigabytes of data written per day. At that rate, this drive would survive 50 years. That is much, much better than any spinning drive will ever give you. So uh, that basically eliminated the concern that flash dies on you. With the current technology and those things, it will survive longer than any of the other parts in your computer. And I'm probably thinking that in this drive, there's also some logic. You know, that there's like a mini CPU inside for a controller. That thing will probably die before the flash sells themselves. So. No concern on my part, this thing survived the torture test in my own hand. This is some of the data we measured on this particular uh, puppy. Um, Ubuntu has a very nice uh, benchmarking tool inside. So we were consistently reading from it about 275 megabytes per second. Write speed was a little less, and we had a pretty consistent latency of about 0.2 milliseconds. You, need, you see here um, an interesting pattern that you see on all flash drives that every now and then you get a little dip in performance that when it does its internal housekeeping, uh, it's very typical. But you see that these lines are straight. If you run the same test on a spinning disk, you see that it is re the, the, the graph will go from up here to down here, it's sort of bent. As you move from the inner part of the disk, where access is fast, to the outer part, it will, or vice versa, um, the speed will be variable. And also, the latency is not going to be near as consistent, uh, at least on your typical less expensive drives. And that includes server drives as well, but very, even more so your, uh, you know, your, your consumer level drives. So that's a typical performance graph of two years ago. Today, you get about twice those numbers. Um, here's some benchmarks on this little thing. Um, from earlier, when we didn't have all those throughput rates, um, the important part is the random uh, reading and writing, uh, especially for small blocks. That's typically what you should think about when you're talking database interactions, uh, reads in your uh, Drupal directory and all of that. So we're looking at, you know, random reads of 20 megabytes per second on this thing and write even better in the 60 plus megabyte per second range. Your spinning disk, just in comparison, will give you around one megabyte per second, right? That's where the difference lies and that's where a lot of magic will happen. Um, a spinning disk, even if you put it into a RAID array, will never go near those numbers unless you do some really crazy enterprise level stuff. And that's just from a dinky little laptop thingy, right? So everybody talks about how crazy fast SSDs are for sequential read and write. You get these numbers of 
you know, uh, today with the newest things, 550 megabytes per second. Um, and that's, yeah, it's sort of nice. It sounds like a really nice number. Um, you know, on the, on the spinning disk, you get maybe 150. Um, but, you know, that's only, what, a factor of three, four at best, that it's faster. To me, that doesn't really change the picture. But here's where the picture gets changed for the random reads and writes, where you get, you know, an order of magnitude, and actually with the newest ones, two orders of magnitude increase in through, uh, throughput. That's where the difference lies. So don't be blinded by this, uh, this particular SSD gives you 500 megabytes per second. This other one gives you 300. That's, that's how fast you can write your big movie file to it. But, well, how many times do you do that in your life? Your everyday life will be starting up an application. It will be a page load in Drupal. It will be all these things. That's where the random performance is important. So look at those numbers. So. And the beauty is because you have, you know, the, the reason why this happens is because you have a 200 times lower latency to access this thing. So every time you need something from this drive, whether you're reading or writing to it, it will just respond a lot faster. It's just, ah, I'm right here. As opposed to, uh, let me spin to that point, and then I'll find that block, and I'll eventually get it to you. Whoa, we're at top speed. I guess I am a high-performance guy. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll switch over. I, I want to give you just a quick taste of how much of a difference this actually makes. Um, so we're switching over to PHP Maya, uh, Maya, uh, Maya Admin. And Bert here, my colleague, has the same database that we're going to import. And I need a volunteer from the crowd with a stopwatch on their smartphone. Yeah, you can do it without. It doesn't make much of a difference. I, I haven't mind dropped. I didn't get around to it. Do we have a stopwatch around on a smartphone somewhere? You can time us. OK, why don't you get that ready? And what we'll do is I'll go to my, um, OK. So we'll, Bert and I will both go to the same database dump and we'll start loading it. Uh, so Bert is of course no slouch either. He has an SSD on his, uh, on his laptop but he also has still a spinning disk and that particular database lives on his spinning disk. So I'll make him the, the victim just to show you what a, sort of a difference it, what it makes. And you, you all know how lengthy it sometimes can be to get your database into MySQL, uh, you know, the dump loaded up. This is a small one that's just from a development server. It does have, you can see it up there, 413 tables and uh, a lot of stuff. So it'll, uh, but it's not large. It's only about five megabytes. So are we ready? Uh, okay. All right. We'll wait. Um, so as I said, about five megabytes, uh, those 413 tables, there will be uh, 2,520 SQL commands that get executed. So queries against the database in the thousand. Uh, almost two and a half thousand, or a little over two and a half thousand. So it's a good exercise. All right, are we all ready? Clock is, all right, the clock is, count us down, please. Okay, seven, five, four, three, two, one. There we go. So it's executing all those queries. Um, Yesterday, when Bert and I went through the exercise, it took me around 15 seconds to load this. Um, as you all know, when you, you, when you load a production database with a lot of stuff, well, there I go. I'm already done. That was about 15 seconds, right? Uh, it was a little longer. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank you. Please be patient. The file is being uploaded. Yes, he's still spinning. So... The trick is think back to those attention intervals of, you know, how long things take. Sometimes you have to walk away from this process and get a cup of coffee and you probably also have a time for a bathroom break with your, um, you know, just exchanging your desk for a couple hundred bucks. Now, uh, you can make this really uh, an order, almost an order of magnitude faster. So that... And, you know, everything is this much faster. Anything you do on your laptop is about this much faster. It actually feels like you bought a whole new machine. 
uh, without having to exchange the entire laptop. You just drop a different disk inside, uh, which is solid state, yeah, and you're still spinning. <laughs> So, you know, I, I want it, it's going to be a bit lengthy, but I wanted to, to really let you experience that because it is done. like done. Okay, what are we looking at? Like a minute and 12 seconds. Okay, there you have it. 21 seconds versus a minute and 12. Okay, so it's not 20x faster for this one because it's uh, actually we're now bound by the speed of, of, the, of the MySQL engine itself and its CPU interaction and a lot of other things that get moved around. Uh, I will say, however, that I also ran it on my dinky little MacBook Air 11-inch with a 1.6 gigahertz CPU and not a nice thing like this here. Um, and it takes is almost as fast as, as the big box. The other thing is, while I'm doing this, there's no moving disk in here, and it's not going to crash. I could have done this while we imported the database. I've actually dropped this thing also while it was running, and uh, you know, there's nothing happens. That's the other real benefit once you don't have spinning platters anymore. Okay, back to your battery That's true. Yeah, you save on the battery. Although you know, I exercise my computer harder when the disk takes less time, so I actually don't save much on the battery. So <laughs> there you have it. Uh, you can't help, I can't help myself. Here are a bunch of other results um, that I did with, with an SSD, and that actually points to some other results. Um, the, uh, the intent was to show how much does Drupal get faster once you get solid-state storage in play on a full-on server. Um, it actually turned out that there were other things in play here, but we started out with the first server, which gave me about 31 transactions per second. So that was running Siege. Siege is a benchmark tool for uh, web servers. Um, and 50 concurrent users. So that's where it maxed out, right? Uh, that was the original version of my site. And then I dropped the solid state storage into that same server and basically got the same results. The reason was I found out later that I had to plug my solid state disk into a RAID controller that was of about 2007 era, and those things just were not built for speed. Uh, you know, basically I was hiding the speed that the solid state storage would have given me. So I dropped it into a second server directly onto the SATA bus, and then tweak that thing a little with, uh, and I'll talk about this in a, in a short while. And now we're looking at 125 simulated users 656 page views per second, and the longest page load, 1.6 seconds, during that torture test of five minutes, right? So that's like total night and day. Um, and, and, uh, and then I also drew, looked at, you know, my then MacBook Pro that also had solid state storage in there that was actually faster than the original server, which had a decent RAID and, and you know, decent stuff. It was a high performance server after all, not just some uh, uh, hand me down Dell box or something. Here's the real fun stuff though, the torture test. I wanted to know, can it actually survive this? So I ran it over the weekend. Um, 140 concurrent users. The, Overall transactions per second dropped a little once you go to this length. But, you know, 483, and that was over, I think, about a thousand nodes on this Drupal site. So not just a front page, right? So I was exercising the entire site, and there were a lot of live views that were only partially cached. And the longest page load in that those 60 seconds took 9.2 seconds. Um, now, what I learned here is that at at some point, the CPU and the RAM became limiting factors and no longer storage. And why was that the case? Uh, all right, so here's some other stuff I learned um, because as I was doing those tests, the, you do need a recent kernel. Um, that was on Linux, but the same is true whether you use a Windows box or a, or a Mac. Um, the various vendors have worked hard on their kernels to cope with the newer storage uh, things that are available. So what we saw um, on, under Linux was the top speed 
going from the standard 2.6.28 kernel, which is what you get in CentOS 5 and, um, and still in CentOS 6, I believe, um, to a 2.6.35 kernel, which we had under, that was, I think, Ubuntu at the point. Uh, we went to 265 megabytes per second, just like that. And all, um, so just the top speed of our SSD went up. Um, that's just because the interface to the drive was improved. You know, now that the, the low latency things are available, suddenly issues in the kernel were uncovered where um, there were race conditions, there were holdups that never turned up because the slow part was elsewhere. So, yeah, okay, so that was two, two versions of Ubuntu. Just a simple upgrade took care of making uh, disk access faster. So the, the thing is, keep your system current, right? Regardless of what operating system you run, because all of the guys are learning what we can now do with faster storage, and they're improving these things all the time. <coughs> um, of course, you want to sort of not be at the total bleeding edge, um, especially not when you have a mission-critical thing ahead of you. Uh, or just learned the hard way that, for example, when you prepare for Drupal Camp LA, my Camtasia doesn't run under Mountain Lion, so... <laughs> Uh, sometimes you get bitten by things, but you do want to stay reasonably current, nevertheless. Um, here's another thing I learned. That server with that recent kernel actually didn't exercise my SSD very hard. In fact, when I ran these torture tests, um, you see circled in yellow that there was actually no read from the disk at all during, during the 10-second intervals that I was... Uh, reading uh, that I was polling. And uh, we were also not waiting on any input-output. But what we did see was little spurts of writes that happened every now and then, like you see circled down here. So what does that say? It's actually the operating system just caching all the stuff in RAM, because I had a healthy amount of RAM in that server. And eventually, my entire Drupal site, my entire database, everything it needed lived in RAM. And that's why you see the crazy speed up, and not because of the solid state drive. Of, of course, the solid state drive makes it fast when the, ca the caches are not warmed up. So the, the lesson I took away from this is that I had to really let the OS2 do its work. Um, I had tweaked my SQL slightly, um, and you know, according to standard recipes, and made the, the, its cache tables larger. Um, I had a, a PC there in there as an opcode optimizer, but not as a cache. I tried that, and it actually got in the way. I also tried other things like a boost module at some point. I tried um, some cache routing module and, and other things. All of those got in the way. The OS by itself was fastest. So the trick is... Recent OSs are really great because all these talented engineers are doing all the work for us. You just stand on the shoulders of giants and let them do the right thing. All you need to do is give your system enough RAM. Whether that's your production server or your local box, max out that RAM. Let the, the, the box do its magic and the rest will follow from there. Okay, and here's another thing is, you know, a laptop SSD was more than able to keep up with full-on server rate uh, disk setup that are built for speed and throughput. Um, so that's, that's really quite amazing. And that's also true in some other environments that I'm not talking about today. So quite a change. So to sum it all up, and we're really making speed. Boy, we don't have to, time for questions. What you really want on your, on your local box is a recent CPU. You want lots of RAM. Max that out. Pay the extra price. Now, in terms of CPU, you know, we can discuss should you have a dual core or quad core. Um, you know, if you think about doing Drupal work, a quad core probably is a nice thing to have because, you know, one core will run your PHP stuff, uh, so your Drupal code. Uh, one core will run your database. Um, and, and, you know, the PHP also includes Apache, of course, because you're probably running standard Apache with, uh, with PHP as a module in there. 
Um, and then you have a core left over for housekeeping and then maybe a little bit elsewhere. So quad core is sort of nice because everybody gets a little piece of the work. But I will say that my 11-inch MacBook Air that only has a dual core 1.6 gigahertz CPU does not feel much slower than my nice box here that I have at work. Uh, it keeps almost up. So you can probably skimp on the CPU a little. So, you know, there's no reason why you should go from the standard offering, which is these days probably about 2.5 gigahertz or so quad core. No reason why you should spend the extra money to go to the 3 gigahertz model. Uh, spend that money on the RAM. Get that RAM upgrade. That's where your speed is going to come from. And then make sure you get solid state storage in there. Don't go for spinning disks anymore. Spinning disks, relegate them to the outside for your backups and for your mass storage, whatnot. But do not live off of spinning platters anymore. It's going to change your life. And then, like we talked about towards the end, you keep your OS updated. People are still working frantically on optimizing all that stuff. Um, so to, to really take advantage of all the new technology that we have at our fingertips. They also tweak things to actually better use the current level of CPUs. They never talk much about this um, when updates come out. It'll say other things like security fixes and all that, but you get that stuff thrown in because it's uh, typically it's not so flashy. And then, you know, go out and check all the resources out there on how to tweak your, uh, your AMP stack, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, and Drupal itself. There's plenty of info out there. Apply the standard stuff. You don't have to go all out and, and spend a lot of time. It's, it, it's really not all that hard. Um, and then you will have a really snappy box. Okay, so I thank you for coming out. And uh, yeah, I guess I did go really fast, so we have time for questions. Yes, Kathy. So, so you have the spinning disk in your, in your thing about upgrading this, upgrading the SSDs. What would be, what metrics would you use to do the trade-off point of where you would get the return on investment? Because it's expensive to just take all of them and upgrade the SSD. So, what what kind of metrics would push me like, yes, that that's we definitely should. Good question. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure uh, how you could easily answer that. I mean, at the end of the day, when you actually let me tell you a story from many years ago, we were looking at scientific visualization where on the older machines that we had, the screen refresh was about five seconds. And then I exchanged a box overnight on that scientist's desk and the screen refresh was two seconds. And he was doing the same work the day previous and the day after. And granted, that's only anecdotal because it's only one data point. But that guy was roughly twice as productive the next day. So that's that magic interval where you wait five seconds or two seconds. And it's not just because he could look at it faster and make his decisions and on what he would think about the fresh display. It was because he was less tired. So. But, you know, if you want to run those metrics, it's going to be expensive to actually gather them. But I'm willing to bet that your increased productivity and you, therefore your increased bottom line, that you get more stuff done during the eight hours that you put in, that this will more than pay for the increased cost of the storage. Now, the other part of the equation is what I addressed towards the end is you can skimp on the CPU and not, you know, get the top. Many people always say, oh, I got to have the absolute fastest I can buy. It's probably not worth your money. Spend that money on the solid state storage when you buy a new box. When you upgrade an existing one, then of course it becomes different. But basically you can repurpose your spinning drive for backups. And then it's the, I don't know, right now the cheapest ones are maybe $1.20 per gigabyte. So you can get a 256 for roughly $300. So that sort of money is normally available during an upgrade cycle if you're looking at institutional environments. Um, or, you know, the, that's the sort of money that we say, hey, let's go to Disneyland this weekend, right? That's kind of what you're going to spend. So to me, that's almost now within the realm of an impulse buy. Maybe not quite, but almost there. So, yeah, you, you still have to justify me. I mean, I, I'm really... I skimp on my own money very often, but that's not one where I would not want to skimp. And in fact, here's the other part of the story. Once you've experienced it, you never want to go back. I made Bert boot into his spinning drive yesterday, 
And he was complaining so loudly, it was not even funny. <laughs> it's, yeah, like, I mean, I said, you know, it's, it feels like a new computer. It's, it feels like it's twice as fast after the upgrade. But you, you only know when you have to go back just how bad it was. So, but metrics are a bit hard to come by because these are not so tangible because we're talking about your overall productivity and uh, unless you keep tabs on that all the time and you can just do it before and after, uh, it's, it's going to be a bit harder. I definitely agree because we've got the fast CPUs and we've seen the latency on the storage, which um, definitely as we go, new machines we're trying to do in this state with the existing one we're having to do the analysis. Yeah. And that's probably a sane approach, and then you judiciously give the nice machines to the people where it matters most, and, uh, and then over time you get the whole transition. Is that about a server farm? Or, yeah. Right. Yeah. That I makes mean, sense. It's, it's, it's bottom line, the most economical point of, of performance improvement. I mean, before SSDs were around, the number one uh, suggestion is to max out your RAM, yeah. right? And now it's like, well, if, if you simply look at the Overall performance improvement of any SSD drive over a mini disk is just huge. So if you have performance issues, you can get an SSD. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, like I said, it, if, if the question is, should we get the faster CPU or should we get solid-state storage, it's no question. The faster CPU will get you, what, an additional 10% in performance, and you'll spend 300 bucks, spend the 300 bucks on an SSD, or maybe two on the server so you can do a rate, uh, you know, mirrored rate setup for them, so for safety. And you should be all right. We have another question. Yes. Uh, I can actually speak to that also. Uh, I do more computer service work than I do. <laughs> now that's interesting to hear. So, how many clients did you do total? Can you say that? Um, Looks like roughly, five. yeah, half a dozen roughly, huh? Yeah. Okay, so it's like one out, one out in five or one out in six where the issue was elsewhere, but and all of the others were like. Yeah, one client actually did notice the speed increase on their computers. Right. It's just that the one program they wanted to. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, and, and if you think back to your development box, you're going to run an unoptimized Drupal, obviously, because you don't want to cache anything because you're doing development, right? And so you're going to hit your PHP code and your database hard. So every interaction is going to be noticeably faster there. So that's basically when you're back to the hardware and not your caching layers, which you build in very carefully once you go into production. So in development, it actually matters even more because you're always going to have a non-optimized environment at all levels of the stack, regardless. Another thing to consider, Kathy, is um, if you're talking about server farms, and, um, and they're uh, very focused in, in the service that they're providing, you may be able to get by, by a small amount of SSD, like a 60 gig drive, which is like 70 bucks. You know, you're not talking about having to buy something Are you just doing Linux or? Okay, so Linux is the kernel as well, like 2 gig? Yeah. Not even, right? You can even pair it down. It's really, really focused. Uh, and then, you know, what's the size of your data? You know, it, it, I'm not sure you're talking about the data. <laughs> I mean, 60 gig, that's a lot of storage for a lot of, for a lot of stuff. And then the Drupal core is going to be like a couple megabytes. Right. So and, and, and you can buy something super, super small. Uh, you don't, I mean, now they're, they're selling. I just bought a 180 gig drive, or I don't know, 150 gig drive for 180. So you can get a 60 for like nothing. Really. Right. And rate that up for as mirrored rate, and that's your root drive, and then drop a bunch of disks in there for the mass storage for you know the massive data amounts that don't need to be fast in the first place. Or like in Drupal land, lots of people put their files resources out into Amazon S3 or something, which is a lot slower than any disks ever have been. Uh, but that's okay. 
and then you put the stuff that matters onto the very fast resources. And that sort. So it's, it's sort of a partitioning of where do you need the speed, where do you not need it. And we have the same at work too. So the, the, the server stuff itself lives on the fast SSD and, and we've got other crud that sits around on spinning disks still. That's what they're good for. Disk is the new tape. <laughs> right. Yeah. Other questions? No? Well, if not, thanks for coming out and enjoy your camp.